This is the first in the lesson series about cells and how cells are structured and how they operate. In this first episode, we're going to introduce the idea that life is a cellular phenomenon. Life on Earth is composed of cells. So we have four and a half billion years ago the formation of the Earth, and the Earth was a lifeless rock. Today, the Earth is teeming with millions and millions and millions of different uh, species of living organisms. Well, they're all made of cells. So the critical jump from no life to life was the emergence of cells. And bacteria are the simplest kinds of cells. So we're going to think of the bacteria type of cell as the inventor of life. Here we see a couple of pictures of bacteria. They're the smallest and simplest cells on earth, and we will credit them for inventing life. Now in past videos, we've seen some um, video of uh, bacteria. Here we're using a dark field uh, microscopy, so the lighting is different. We have a dark background and the uh, cells are illuminated brightly. So these are the creatures that are doing this thing we call life. And they gave rise to all life on planet Earth. That's the story that modern science is putting before us. So that forces us to sort of think about life in the context of the universe. Life is a planetary phenomenon. Possibly it, it could emerge on a moon, for example. But what we mean here is that by saying it's a planetary phenomenon, there have to be the right kinds of conditions, the chemical condi conditions, the, the flows of energy and the uh, a diversity of chemical uh, compounds in some uh, suitable place on a planet or a moon. And then you have the possibility for life to emerge. As far as we understand life, it just would not be able to emerge inside the core of a star, for example. So life is something that a planet, possibly a moon, can produce. A lifeless rock to a rock with life. NASA has a definition for life, a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. Now, if you look at a modern textbook and, uh, and you're in the chapter where they're talking about life, a lot of textbooks will have this list of characteristics that all living things possess. And you have to have all these characteristics to be uh, understood to be alive. So living things are highly organized and self-maintaining. They use energy, perform complex chemical reactions called metabolism. They reproduce and show heredity. They possess adaptations and undergo evolutionary change. They grow, sometimes develop an age, and respond to their environment. They are either cells or are composed of many cells. So again, there might be lots of objects uh, around the world that have a few of these characteristics. But if you do not have all of these characteristics, you are not said to be alive. Now, the way we understand life on Earth, bacteria cells are the smallest things on Earth that have all of these characteristics. So we will be learning that bacteria are composed of smaller things, molecules, and molecules are not alive. The, the bacteria cell would be the smallest kind of living thing. It has all of these characteristics. Let's situate life on our concept map that we've seen before. Now, these are just objects in the universe, and they have different sizes. But now we're interested in life. So where are we going to put life? Let's just recap our, uh, our uh, map here. Down at the bottom, we learned that the early universe produced subatomic particles. And then uh, the, those subatomic particles formed the first atoms of hydrogen and helium. And gravity condensed those clouds of hydrogen and helium into stars. And stars made heavier elements and blasted them out in supernova. So stars made all the different kinds of atoms in the periodic table. And then out there in space, as atoms bumped around into each other, uh, molecules were formed as, as uh, atoms f uh, made chemical bonds with each other. And that can happen in space, but it can also happen on planets and on moons. But it's here where we get to the emergence of life with cells, at least as far as we understand it on Earth. Life is cellular. So somewhere on Earth, complex molecules assembled into living cells. And so that's where we're going to call the origin of life. So, of course, that was a momentous event because in the last four billion years, 
these first living cells went on to go through this evolutionary process that uh, multiplied the number of species until we have millions and millions of living things today. Of course, life also got more complex. We got, have single-celled organisms, but then we, uh, in time, uh, we see multi-celled organisms appearing in the evolutionary record. So this means then that, that our concept of life emerges right here with cells. Everything above this, we would say, is alive. Of course, animals and plants are alive. Why is that? They're composed of organs, and those organs are made of tissues, and tissues are made of living cells. So animals are alive in virtue of being made of living units that we call cells. But if you go the other way, uh, molecules are not alive. Atoms are not alive. Uh, protons and neutrons and electrons are not alive. We say they're not alive because they do not possess all of these characteristics. None of these objects below the level of cells possesses these characteristics, so they are not said to be alive. So we have a curious thing. A living cell is composed of non-living parts. Kind of fun to ponder. So what are living bacteria made of? They're as we just saw, they're made of molecules. Here we see a little cartoon bacterium and uh, then a breakdown of the kinds of molecules you'll find in a cell. 70% of the mass of the bacterium would be water molecules. So that's the principal fluid inside the cell that makes up the cytoplasm of the cell. And then 30% would be of a variety of different kinds of chemicals. And here we've expanded that down here. So 15% of those molecules would be proteins and 4% small molecules, 6% RNA, 2% lipids, 1% DNA, 2% polysaccharides. Those would be sugars. So cells are made of molecules, which of course are made of atoms. And water is the major component of cells. But it's these molecules that are doing the business of life. Of course, we'll see water's critical for that business of life. But uh, these are the, uh, the important uh, molecules that uh, we'll focus on in the rest of this uh, series. Well, let's take a look at some of them. Here, here in the middle of the, of the diagram, we have a cartoon bacterium. It has a cell membrane. And we see some DNA. It's filled with water. Got a protein there and there's sugar coming in. Let's take a look at a couple of the molecules that cells are made up of. First of all, the cell membrane is made up of two layers of molecules called lipids. So sometimes it's called a lipid bilayer. And each lipid molecule has sort of a head region and two tails. And the tail of a lipid molecule is a fat molecule. So when we eat fat in our diet, we're getting the molecules that our cells need to build new cell membranes. Of course, we've learned that glucose here is the product of photosynthesis. And of course, animals uh, metabolize glucose to get energy. So here the cell is importing glucose. So that is a very important energy molecule. Of course, plants also use glucose as a structural material to build cellulose, part of the cell wall. Well, here are two other important molecules in the cell. Proteins are very large molecules, and all proteins on Earth are composed of 20 different types of amino acids, and every protein has a unique type of sequence of those amino acids. So each type of protein has its own unique sequence. Uh, a, an amino acid is just this structure you see down here, and amino acids differ by whatever's in this position here, indicated by the R. And then we have DNA the double helix. There are four chemicals that make up the rungs of the DNA ladder, as it were. And it's this molecule that is responsible for storing the recipes for building proteins. This molecule can be duplicated so living things can reproduce. And this molecule changes over time as errors are made when it's duplicated, giving living things the ability to change over time. All right, we're going to use this cartoon cell to illustrate some of the basic features of cellular life on Earth. And we'll do so by sort of asking some questions and then answering them by highlighting some of the uh, parts of the diagram. So what are cells? Well, we can kind of borrow from NASA. Cells are self-sustaining chemical systems. 
Now, by self-sustaining chemical system, it's a chemical system because the chemistry is going on within a boundary. And all the chemistry, all the chemicals inside the cell, they can't easily get out. So they're forced to interact. That boundary is the cell membrane. So it's a self-contained structure here. And how is it self-sustaining? That gets us to the next question. Well, what are cells doing? They're doing what we're calling the chemistry of life. So this is how they're sustaining themselves. Now, what are examples of the chemistry of life? These down here. Cells are releasing energy from food. They are building and repairing cell parts, which are just molecules. They're responding to the environment in useful ways, and they're reproducing. So these are all examples of the chemistry of life. How do cells do the chemistry of life? They have teams of proteins that perform a wide variety of different kinds of chemical reactions. Some of those proteins are going to be getting uh, energy out of their food. Some of the proteins are going to be building molecules that the cell is made of. So how do cells keep doing the chemistry? Cells get energy and materials from the environment. So for cells, sometimes a molecule might be a source of energy like glucose. Other kinds of cells capture sunlight energy to power the chemistry. Of course, all cells need basic building materials as well to build the molecules that cells are made of. What is the energy used for? Well, we're back to the chemistry of life, building and repairing and replacing the molecules out of which cells are made. Why must cells eliminate waste? Because waste would interfere with the chemistry of life. So there's a whole lot of chemistry going on here that will produce waste materials. And if that waste material builds up, it actually starts to slow down the forward chemical reactions and the chemistry of life would stop. Where did the cells proteins come from? Cells build their own proteins using the energy and the nutrients from the environment. So cells are like a construction site. They're building the proteins and then the proteins are working out there on the factory floor doing all the chemistry of life. How do cells know how to build proteins? And here the answer is DNA. Cells have DNA that stores the recipe for each protein's construction. So each of these three different proteins would have its own recipe stored in the DNA molecule. How can cells reproduce? Well, because DNA can be duplicated and passed on to two daughter cells. So the parent cell can duplicate this DNA and then divide into two cells, each cell getting a copy of the DNA, which stores the recipes to build all the key players here, the proteins. How can life evolve? Well, because when DNA gets duplicated, sometimes mistakes happen. We call them mutations. That means that the two daughter cells might be different from the parent and different from each other. And this gives rise to the possibility that living things can change over time in a process we will be calling evolution. So if we think about NASA's definition, a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution, that's what we have here. A self-sustaining chemical system self-sustaining because the chemistry of life in here is continually um, maintained by getting resources and energy from the environment and getting rid of waste and Darwinian evolution requires that organisms living things can reproduce and change over time and that is possible because of this important molecule of DNA so a living cell is composed of molecules that interact in space and time. As the molecules interact, they carry out the chemistry of life, thus giving cells all the characteristics on the list. So you see, if you went through these characteristics again, so all of these characteristics are true of this sort of cartoon cell here. In fact, every cell on Earth, we say, is alive because it has all these characteristics. Now, life on Earth is critically dependent upon water. Why is that? Because water dissolves many kinds of molecules and allows them to chemically interact as they bounce around within the cell. So this chemistry of life is happening in water. 
So this is why scientists are really interested in finding other planets that might have water on the surface. And generally, a planet has to be a certain distance from its star. So it's in the habitable zone so that water can exist as a liquid on the surface. These are the really interesting planets for scientists who are looking for other worlds that might have life. So somewhere on the early Earth, perhaps deep in the oceans, chemistry produced life. Now take a look on the left here. Here is our cartoon cell and we have the four classes of molecules that cells are composed of. Lipids, sugars, DNA, amino acids that make up proteins. So somewhere on planet Earth some four billion years ago these molecules were created and began interacting to form a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. Now many biologists think the scene might have looked like this. These are undersea hydrothermal vents. These rocky towers have tiny little chambers about the size of cells where lots of interesting chemistry might have gone on. And here the, in this artist's rendering we see these globes emerging from their rocky nurseries. These would be the first living cells that would be the ancestors to all life on planet Earth. Now that seems sort of like an improbable event, but we have to remember the time scale. Perhaps 300 million years of experimental chemistry in these rocky chambers. That's a long, long time. Evidently, life emerged on our planet. Now, of course, those first life forms would have had to have gotten energy somewhere. And uh, there would have been lots of uh, organic molecules in the oceans for them to consume and use as a source of energy and building materials. But the key to life on Earth was DNA. DNA has three properties that make it the hereditary molecule for life on Earth. It carries the information to construct a living cell by coding for the proteins that perform the chemistry of life. DNA can be duplicated and that allows for reproduction. And DNA can also change its information content, allowing for life to evolve. Now on Earth, it was DNA that captured a recipe for constructing life, but on another planet, for an alien creature, some other molecule must play a similar role. If these organisms are going to be alive, then there must be some kind of recipe for the construction of that organism that can be duplicated and passed on as they reproduce. And many scientists think that an evolutionary process is going to be playing out everywhere in the galaxy where life emerges. So if, it, if these creatures don't have exactly the DNA molecule, and it's likely it would not be exactly DNA, there must be some other molecule or molecules that are performing the hereditary role. So what we have then is a lifeless rock produced life in the form of cells. Cells emerged, they reproduced, they spread across the earth and evolved into all living things today. Here's our tree of life. And we, we think of life as a planetary phenomenon. Of course, it could happen on a moon or whatnot, but there have to be uh, ideal conditions for chemistry to take place under just the right circumstances to form that self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. Now in the remainder of the lesson series, we're going to be using these cartoon cells to understand the similarities and differences from different life forms on Earth. So here we have a simple cell, small bacterium cell, and then we've got more complicated, larger and more complicated animal cells and plant cells. And we'll see that there are differences between these cells, but there's lots of similarities as well. And the reason why there are so many similarities, scientists argue, is because all life on Earth can trace their ancestry back to the inventors of life, these first small, simple bacteria-like cells.